welcome. God bless you. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Before we get into our next message, starting in 1 Peter chapter 4, I have a prayer request. I'm studying a difficult, uh, for me, a difficult subject of apostasy, and I'm ashamed I've put it off this long. I've always lived off of what other men studies, and sometimes you need to study something out and work through it yourself, and this is one of those issues I feel the Lord is prompting me to do, especially at this time of life and this time of the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come until there shall be the falling away, or a falling away first, and the man of sin and will be revealed the son of perdition, that, that text. So that's one of the launching pad verses, why I'm desiring to want to study that. So I'd appreciate your prayers that God would guide me in this and give me wisdom. It has some other important related topics that are attached to it and to that. I need to get some understanding. And it'll probably end up showing up in my preaching sometime. So thank you. Um, well, let's continue on with our study in 1 Peter chapter 4. Mine says, for as much, which most other translations says, therefore, which is the better rendering. Whenever you see a therefore, you need to see what it's there for. So it's, see, when Peter wrote this, he wrote a letter. He didn't put chapters and verses in it, and we all know that. But it helps us find places and study Scripture easier having that. So last week's message was uh, gone to heaven, and it was just comma after comma after comma in that five, six verse section there. Just the continuing thought right on. Now when he uses therefore, he's pointing back to it. So we need to look back at it just for a moment. It's just the, Peter's emphasis once again of the gospel. Verse 18 of chapter 3, For as much then as Christ also hath suffered for us in the flesh, suffered for us, he says this, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So there's two very important parts, the death and resurrection of Christ. He emphasizes the resurrection down just a little bit further in verse 21, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he says, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. So in other words, uh, it's like somebody hanging a sign on their desk or on the door, gone to lunch. You know they're going to be back. So he's making reference to his return with gone to heaven, and it says he's set down at the right hand of God, and is on the right hand of God. It's kind of like that Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the same, the shame, and is now set down on the right hand of God. This right hand is a position of authority or of power. Jesus, when he's ascending into heaven, his disciples are looking at him, his last words, he says, Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then he commissions them, go ye therefore in that authority. That authority is a powerful thing with regard to the gospel. All authority means every realm, both seen and unseen, kings and kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness, Satan is the king of that kingdom of darkness. Whether it be rulers or principalities or any kind of powers or authority. We need to know this, and I want to emphasize it just for a moment, that Satan is not the final authority. He likes to promote himself like he's got the last say. He doesn't. Christ Jesus has all authority given unto him. As we approach our Christian life, we need to have that mentality, that perspective on life. There is an authority above every authority I will see kings and kingdoms, and I need to go and live out my Christian life in light of that authority that God has put me under his authority. We have that authority in Christ. Well, here's what he says now. Therefore, then, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Arm yourselves. That's a military term which tells us we need to realize there's going to be some conflict in this thing of following Christ. And he's the example. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, 
but made of himself no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that's the mind. But when, when Jesus came, he had prepared his mind, his life. There's going to be conflict. I am going to the cross. Everything is going to oppose me. I can expect that. And we look at the sufferings of Christ, for as Christ has suffered for us, arm yourself with that same mind. Revelations chapter 12 and verse 11 says this, with regard to death, because Jesus said he armed himself even to the point of death. Do we do that? Should we do that? Is it possible to do that? Revelations 12, 11 says, and they overcame him, meaning Satan, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Christ on the cross, and they're jeering at him, come down and we'll believe who you are. Could he have come down? Yeah. But he loved not his life unto death. He says, arm yourselves with that same mind. You look at the Christian life, is Christ worth living for? Yes. Is he worth dying for? Our faith. In Psalms 23 and verse 4, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That is almost prophetic with reference to Christ. Well, it says here, when we arm ourselves with that mind, which, by the way, when we take that weapon away from the enemy, we no longer have a fear of death. It has an effect upon us. It says, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Let me give you two thoughts on that. Number one, heaven. There's no sin in heaven. When we find ourselves in our final home with God in heaven, we'll cease from sin, it won't be there. There's another thought. It says, and I, I lean this direction, sin diminishes when we committed ourselves to Christ to the point of suffering and even death. The things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We, it, it loses its appeal. I don't know how to say this. We ought to practice dying. Daily. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he said, I die daily. He was practicing for what would ultimately come, saying no to self. There's something, there's more to life than just being alive. And death we know has been settled because Christ conquered sin and death and hell and rose from the dead. So he said, I die daily. Romans 14, 8, it says this, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. So then, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. You see, we're win-win in this. You live for Christ, die in Christ, heaven. That should have an effect upon how we look at life and how we live life. Well, let's go to verse 2. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. The rest of his time, talking about future tense, Yesterday's gone. Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. We don't want to be a prisoner of our past, of our past victories or of our past sins. Forgetting those things and then reaching forth the rest of his time. Reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press on toward the mark of the prize of the, calling, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus till I hear the heavenly call and I'm with the Lord, I press on. Live the rest of our time, not in the lust of men, but to the will of God. Verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, carousings, and abominable idolatries. An idol is anything you love more than God, and we found ourselves bowing down to all the temporal things of this world. Those are overt sins. I, I think there's an emphasis upon the outward sins. We don't care less. We're just going to live our life any way we want to. In fact, in verse 4, when it talks about the response of people when they see a changed life, in which they, unbelievers, think it strange that you run not with them. To the same, my old translation says, profligacy, which doesn't help, okay? That's a word that Schofield inserted there to 
try to help us with understanding excessive riot. Basically, it means this. With unrestrained living. Just live any old way you want to live. I can. I'm not responsible to anybody else. When we used to live that way, the over sins, they lose their appeal. 2 Corinthians 7.1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Sound like a familiar theme? There are still sins in our flesh. I deal more with the, the sins that comfortably live in the dim regions of my darkened heart. Oh, they don't show up out here very often. But they live, the, the thoughts, my responses, my reactions to things. Are they initially in the flesh or in the spirit? Uh, usually they're in the flesh and then I have time. Then I react properly in the spirit to God. But I still have to deal with some of those things that are still there. Peter talked about that earlier in his letter. We had a message called The Happiness of Holiness. In 1 Peter 1, after he gives us the theme, we've been begotten again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Look at verse 13 of chapter 1. It says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, arm yourself likewise with the same mind that Christ had. When we begin to change the way we think, we begin to change the way we behave. And that's what people notice. Notice behaviors. They can't read your mind. But they know your behavior, so they know what's going on in your mind. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lust in your ignorance when you didn't know Christ, but as he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Holiness is not sinless perfection. Holiness is walking in fellowship with God according to the means that he has provided. What has he provided? Confession and repentance and forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Up, oh, at it again. Failure, and those times of failures become, the distance between them becomes greater and greater. And we find ourselves walking in the spirit more than walking in the flesh. That we should not live our lives in the lust of the flesh, but to the, to the will of God. God's will is for us to walk with him in fellowship. And he's made a provision for that. Well, verse 4, I want to make a comment on that. They think it's strange that you don't run with them like you used to. Where there has been a change of heart and mind, there will be a change of behavior, and others will notice it and may not applaud you. In fact, more commonly than not, won't be happy for you that you're no longer living the way you used to live. In fact, it will draw criticism because... Nothing is more convicting, not your words, but a lifestyle that has changed. There's nothing more convicting to an unbeliever than a change of life. I remember one time hearing some guys say of me, when they knew me before I was committed to Christ, and they saw the changes that were happening in my life. Eh, he's got religion right now, but he won't last long. He'll be back. He'll come back to his old. And I didn't. And that was convicting to them. Well, verse 5, Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the living and the dead? If I were to title this message, it would be, Give an answer. God's going to ask us a question, and we have to give an account of ourselves. Let me give you some scripture. Romans 14, 11, and 12 say this, For it is written, saith the Lord, that every knee shall bow, and every conf tongue confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. I won't have to give an account for my parents, my wife, my children, my pastor, my neighbor. But we will all have a time when we have to give an account of ourselves to God. For the Christian, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the things we've done, our works. We won't have to give an account for our sins. Our sins have been paid for. But we will have to give an account for how we have lived out our faith, what we have done in the flesh, in a body, in living out the Christian life. For the unbeliever, Revelations chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. 
and the books will be opened, and God will say, give an account, give an answer to me. You see, but I didn't know. And God will say, I made you, you knew that, and you chose not to believe that. You knew in your heart that I made you, I sustained you, I gave you life. You realize that there were times you thought you were protecting, taking care, good judgment, nice, nice driving or whatever. And it was me that sustained your life, gave you food, gave you breath in life. I gave you my word. I gave you myself. I gave you life. Give an account. Sobering. And there will be none. And it says that there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth at that accounting that God demands an account of us. We can't pull this out of our Christian theology or out of the Word of God. Give an answer. 1 Peter 3, 15, an earlier message, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. That's part of my hope. I will give an account to God someday for my works and I will wish I had lived a better Christian life than I had. But my sins have been paid for. The only thing I have to offer God on account of my sin is Christ, is his provision for me himself. In that I take great confidence. Verse 6. By the way, accountability is some of the best evidence for God. People know that. Even, even the sin nature that says, I'm not accountable to anybody. They know better than that. They expect accountability from other people. They expect accountability of themselves, and they know it. And man knows within his heart, I have this built-in accountability that I know one day I will have to give an account for my life to someone who is it? It's to God. It's evidence for God. You, we can't shake that. I don't care where you're at on the planet, what time in which you were born. We realize that that is a, a God-created thing placed in our hearts when he, writ, when he wrote his laws in the heart of man the moral code that people live by. They know there's accountability to that. It's great evidence for God. Well, I'm going to close with verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Peter knew people that had died, their flesh in the grave, decomposing, turning back to dust. He knew that. But he also knew that the spirit part of that man, if they were in Christ and believers in God's word, in the truth, and born again, he knew they were very much alive. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to give you verses 1 and 2, and then verse 8. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Some of the translations say, we earnestly desire this. We, we groan within ourselves, earnestly desire to be clothed upon with our body, which is from heaven. That spiritual man one day, in the presence of the Lord, reunited with a, a resurrected body. We, we long for that. In fact, Paul in verse 8 says it this way, We are confident, I say, and rather willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When a believer dies, their spirit instantly is very much alive, more than it ever has been, in the presence of the Lord. And one day, we'll be reunited with a resurrected body. That's a great part of the living hope of believers. Well, until next time, may the God of all grace, who hath called you unto his eternal glory, after you've suffered a while, make you Perfect. Strengthen, establish, and settle you. God bless you.